All right, so it is a pleasure to welcome people for the second day and kickoff of the Precision Neuroscience meeting. And it's my pleasure uh, to chair this session as we go forward and introduce the speakers. So our first speaker is not a stranger to Roanoke. Uh, he's actually been here before, and we convinced him to come back now and again. Uh, Dr. Carl Svoboda from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, Janelia campus in Ashburn uh, is here. And I, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but he, he was either the first or one of the first investigators at the HHMI campus at Janelia when they set up that fantastic facility there, a group leader, uh, and has run a phenomenal program there. Uh, Dr. Svoboda uh, trained initially in physics uh, at Cornell and then on to Harvard to study biophysics. Uh, then went to uh, do research at the Bell Labs, where he served as a postdoctoral fellow. And from there took, a, I guess it was a faculty position at Cold Spring Harbor and had the opportunity at the Cold Spring Harbor Labs to have his own group there and uh, start uh, and continue to do fantastic things. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he has uh, won the Brain Prize last year. We heard about the Lungbuck Foundation Brain Prize, and we just saw this year as winners. And Dr. Svoboda was a winner of the prize last year which I understand has a nice cash award, which he deserved for the incredible work that he's done. Uh, and he's made uh, fantastic contributions across the board using imaging and powerful new ways, developing new tools, looking at both sensory and motor systems in the intact living brain uh, at unprecedented scales of both uh, spatial and temporal analysis over large scales. And I, I think it's safe to say that his work, uh, not only being some of, some of the absolute best in the field, but has opened up new vistas and windows, literally and <laughs> figuratively, and, and conceptually into our ability to think about how circuits behave uh, inside the living brain. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Carl Svoboda. Carl. Thanks, Mike. Uh, great. This is, uh, it's wonderful to be back here. And um, it's uh, just a maze, but by what, guy, what kind of things you've been able to build here, what kind of a place you've been able to build in a short time. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, good. So um, today I tell you about, a, I decided to tell you about a couple of neurotechnology projects at uh, Genelia. And this is a meeting about precision neuroscience. And ultimately, uh, precision uh, refers to uh, measurements, I think, about the brain, uh, at least in, in many contexts. And so I uh, talk about neurotechnology. These are uh, projects that are highly co collaborative, um, and, and they're really about imaging neurons in their native habitat uh, as animals explore the environment. And I'd like to show you that we can now probe the dynamics of neurons in intact brains from synapses, really over all length scales of organization, from synapses, micrometer levels, to brain regions without giving up on uh, the synapse scale. So really a multi-scale analysis of neural dynamics is becoming a possible, at least in model system. Now, really start by talking about the engineering of fluorescent proteins to probe neural function. These are the molecules that couple, okay, function of neurons to signals that we can actually measure in the microscope. And uh, this is really the key enabling technology that has evolved over the last, or has been evolved, uh, as you see, over the last uh, decade. More than anything else, has really driven progress in the field. So I'll give you a little update. And the new sensors for neural function, in turn, are begetting or uh, catalyzing new developments in new microscopy methods, including the kinds of stuff you'll hear from uh, Eric Betsy today. Now, given that uh, we are neighbors in Virginia, or near neighbors, uh, and both new on the scenes, I, I decided also to start off by telling you a little bit about the uh, Janelia Research uh, Center uh, that I'm part of. Okay, so we're fully funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. We're about 30 miles from the White House on the banks of the Potomac River um, and uh, 10 miles or so from the Dallas airport, about three hours from um, Roanoke. Uh, we opened our doors about 10 years ago We'll, uh, we'll actually have a bunch of celebrations later this year, 10-year anniversary. And our uh, research building, really quite a stunning structure, houses currently about 500 scientific staff. We have room for a couple hundred more, but there's no plan uh, to grow over the next couple of years. So we have a research focus. So this is, uh, uh, we're about 10% of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and it's a focused endeavor. And our focus is really to identify the principles by which neural circuits process, of the brain process information and to develop the technologies, imaging and computational technologies to support 
this effort. So we both do, scientists at Genia both pursue fundamental brain research, mainly in genetic model organisms, flies and mice. We think that uh, these are much more accessible systems and we think that general principles will be gleaned from uh, these model organisms that are relevant to the brain in general. In addition, we invest heavily in technology development, and that's what I'll tell you about today. And of course, these technology efforts usually have much broader uh, implications, and they're applicable to most systems. So current, just to give you an overview, uh, current technology efforts include engineering uh, proteins for neural function. I'll delve into the details a little bit more. Creating new transgenic animals, right, to target these proteins to specific neurons so that we can look at these neurons, manipulate these neurons designing microscopes to look at neurons. I'll give you a little flavor of that, and you hear a lot more about that from Eric tonight. And finally, um, uh, designing and inventing algorithms to deal with a uh, large scale, this, this, this deluge in l big data that we're all facing based on these new measurement tools. So there are basically multiple tracks of doing research at Genelia. Uh, at the core is an investigator track, about 40 laboratories headed by principal investigators, and Eric Wetzig and I are principal investigators. These are research groups that are investing, where the research program is driven by the investigators, a bit like university labs, but they're key differences I'd like to highlight. The, loop, the labs are small. We have typically on the order of five research staff, and most of us try to practice open science. So the fruits of our research are made available quickly and openly and dis disseminated as widely as possible. About a quarter of the research labs also focus on our technology. So we have chemists, we have protein engineers, um, and people like Eric who m uh, primarily develop uh, microscopes. And finally, we're strongly encouraged to collaborate. So this is part, actually, of our evalu evaluation criteria. And so rather than discouraging collaboration, we're strongly uh, encouraged to collaborate. And I think Mike is uh, also a strong proponent of collaboration here. So in addition to this more traditional track, we have uh, something called project teams. And I'll give you an example of a project team. And this is quite unusual. These are focused on de developing particular resources or technologies. And if you have ideas about some bottleneck in brain research, right, bra uh, bring this to our attention because there might be a possibility that we can organize a project team with substantial funding to address one of these bottlenecks. And we have, and uh, so project teams are typically led by multiple investigators and they can be larger, up to about 20 staff. And, and they have milestones and deliverables. So in that case, they're more like biotech companies. And I think this is very important in uh, neurobiology because in contrast to, for example, genomics and molecular biology, there are very little commercial drivers to do the engineering to improve tools and uh, techniques by factors of two that ultimately make them powerful in the lab or in uh, the clinic, and we have a way uh, to do this. And, um, and the scientific output from project teams is always distributed to the scientific community, and here in this case, uh, often and mostly long before uh, publication. So current, current project teams include efforts like reconstructing the entire Drosophila brain at electron microscopic resolution, so from uh, synapses to the entire uh, brain as a sort of community resource, atlas of cell types in uh, flies and mice to give us a sense of the diversity of cell types in uh, the brain in mammals and uh, non-mammalian model systems. So let me give you uh, one example in a little bit more detail. So the GENI project is this the genetically encoded neural indicator and effector project, okay? Engineers uh, protein tools, so genetically targetable tools to manipulate uh, neurons and also to read out the activity of neurons. And the impact, I think, of the Gini project has been quite substantial. It has really uh, catalyzed the field of uh, cellular imaging in neuroscience. And just to give you some numbers, just this year alone, uh, 280 research publications are based on Gini sensors, so proteins uh, engineered by the Gini uh, project. These are, of course, publications. The vast majority of these are from outside of Janelia. Uh, from institutions in, uh, uh, in, in the U.S., in Europe, including Norway, and probably from the Curlion. So in the Gini project, one of the core goals is to develop imaging technology to read out neural activity on all scales. And this is 
an old slide now uh, from uh, the days of Bell Labs where we did uh, one of the foundational experiments and, and others did similar experiments um, of this uh, type where we recorded activity here of a neuron using two photon microscopy in the intact brain uh, with a small pipette that impales the neuron, okay, an incredible, this is an artisanal experiment, very, very difficult, okay. Um, actually, Mike did these kinds of experiments uh, many years ago now, uh, where the electrode imp impales this neuron. And here, we were in addition able to introduce a calcium sensitive dye in, uh, to the neuron, the kind of dye that Roger Chen uh, invented. Roger just died, but he's really the father of uh, this field of cellular. Uh, imaging in uh, neuroscience. And uh, you can see that when uh, we combine imaging with measuring of spikes in this neuron, for example, when providing a sensory stimulus, there's a close correspondence between fluorescence transients in the neurons and this train of action potential. It's really a one-to-one -one correspondence because when an action potential, and even Hodgkin and Huxley knew this, when an action potential uh, goes through a neuron, or an axon, or the cell body, it opens voltage-gated channels, calcium comes in rapidly, and this can be detected as a proxy for activity. And this got us thinking, many other people thinking, that perhaps we can now very efficiently, using imaging methods, read out the activity of large populations of neurons. Perhaps we can use calcium imaging to read out activity of tiny neuronal structures like these dendrites and synaptic structures that are inaccessible really to um, other kinds of uh, investigation, okay? Now, of course, this kind of way to introduce the indicator doesn't scale to the whole brain, so what, uh, for these reasons, okay, uh, much of the recent progress in the field has been due to protein sensors, okay, that now can be introduced into neurons using the methods of uh, genetics, right? So, and fortunately, soon after the cloning of green fluorescent protein, all of you know green fluorescent protein, smart folks, in particular, again, starting with uh, Roger Chen, figured out how to make uh, green fluorescent protein calcium sensitive, how to couple the fluorescence properties of green fluorescent proteins, perhaps to the function of a cell. Um, um, and for many years, though, these protein sensors, they worked pretty well in cuvettes, okay? They were sort of the subject of PhD theses in, for example, Rogers Lab or some other laboratories, but they were not nearly sensitive enough to pick up neural activity inside the brain. It turns out that the calcium transients produced by action potentials are actually very, very fast and very tiny and difficult to measure with these sensors. So uh, when we uh, started at, uh, and in, indeed I was one of the first, I was the first uh, investigator at uh, the Genelia Research Campus. One of the other early investigator was this fellow here, Lauren Luger, protein engineer, and we decided to tackle this problem, and, and he really did uh, much of the heavy lifting in the early days. And we focus on this scaffold, the G-CAMP uh, sensor. This is based on a circularly permuted fluorescent protein, GFP, that uh, on its non-native now CNN termini has a calcium binding protein attached to it, calmodulin, and a calmodulin binding peptide. And it was circularly permuted in such a way that it has this gash in its side uh, that provides access to solvent. And the fluorophore, the chromophore, is inside of this proteinaceous pocket. And when sol solvent, water, has access to the uh, uh, fluorophore, it produces a dim fluorophore. It does not uh, fluoresce. So when calcium comes in, uh, and this is now based on structural work from Lauren and, uh, uh, Sh uh, and, and also Eric Schreider, another protein engineer at Genelia, calcium comes in, it binds to calmodulin. The calmodulin wraps around the M13 binding peptide, and the complex plugs this hole and now protects the chromophore from aqueous medium, now producing a bright uh, green fluorescent molecule. And what we figured out in the early days of protein engineering, which was just uh, putzing around mutating sensor, or mutating the sensor in the vicinity of the chromophore, uh, these linkers, we figured out that this indicator, this fluorescent protein, is incredibly malleable. By mutagenizing uh, specific parts of the protein, we could change its function, the kinetics, the response amplitude, the resting fluorescence, and so on forth. But it was often very difficult to predict what particular amino acid changes would do to the function of the 
a protein. And for that reason, we really turned to high throughput screening and founded the uh, Gini uh, project. So the way to think about the Gini project, it's um, essentially a biotech company. It's run like a biotech company within uh, 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 Genelia, okay? But the product is reagents and knowledge about using these indicators, okay, that, that are made freely available. So the business model, in other words, is to lose about one and a half million dollars a year. And uh, so, and, and the core technology is high throughput uh, screening. And I won't go through the details. We have a lot of very quantitative assays to evaluate the biophysics of these sensors in neurons, so 96 well plates, automated microscopes, that kind of thing. So the way we operate basically is we start with a scaffold like GCAMP, okay, then do structure guided mutagenesis, uh, we apply our crank, these highly uh, quantitative scalable assays, and go through loops of improvements until we're satisfied and we can distribute uh, to the community an optimized tool. I'll give you just one story here that you're per perhaps familiar with. This is uh, the story of GCAM6. This is probably the, certainly the most widely used uh, protein uh, sensor in the community. And what we wanted to do uh, with GCAM6, by the way, we have uh, newer and better reagents coming out pretty soon. We wanted to beat the best synthetic indicator in terms of detecting action potential. So here's the response of about a thousand variants of GCAMP, okay, to single action potentials in this histogram. You can see that some single mutants already come close to the best synthetic indicator, Oregon Green Baptor. One here, so we decided we did another round of mutagenesis where we combined beneficial mutations and now some of the uh, best sensors actually exceed uh, the best uh, sensors that uh, synthetic chemists were able uh, to, uh, to make. So we picked a couple of sensors here and um, evaluated in them in more uh, uh, interesting test beds. For example, in the um, uh, visual cortex, so now we used a viral vector and introduced uh, GCAMP into the visual cortex of a mouse, and the mouse now is faced with a drifting grading um, oriented in various uh, 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 directions, and this is just to really test the indicator in a test bed where we know a lot about the responses of the neurons. And there are, of course, the famous orientation tuned neurons here that respond to uh, drifting uh, gradings. And here is a two photon image now of such a region inf infected with GCAM6 in the visual cortex. You can see neurons show up as these ring-like structures because GCAM does not get into the nucleus of the neuron. And you can see uh, individual neurons uh, responding to drifting gradings of particular locations. So you can then convince yourself that the orientation map detected with uh, a GCAM here is very similar uh, to what is e expected based on electron uh, previous electrophysiological uh, measurements. But here, of course, you get the whole picture, a dense sampling of uh, uh, the active neurons here over a scale of about 150 or 200 micrometers all at once. And we don't miss any activity, and you can convince yourself of that using uh, an experiment uh, with an experiment like this. So here's a simultaneous uh, electrophysiological measurement, very similar to the one that I've shown you earlier uh, with synthetic indicators. Here is the GCAM on top in yellow is the GCAM fluorescence transients corresponding to trains of action potentials. Again, you can very uh, much convince yourself just by glancing at the fluorescence transients that we can pick out most of the uh, this activity of the neuron, even individual action potentials with good uh, signal to noise uh, ratio. So now we're looking at the output of neurons. These action potentials, of course, radiate out the axon and into the synapses to activate other neurons. Can we now look at uh, the signals that activate uh, the neuron itself, that produce uh, this output? And indeed, uh, we can, uh, just to show you uh, one example of that. So here uh, we, <coughs> let's go on here, yeah. So here we're looking at uh, the dendrites of a neuron. So we go into the dendritic arbor with a synapse that said these are spines, individual dendritic spines, and here you now see fluorescence flashes that correspond to the activation of NMDA receptors, synaptic NMDA receptors. And now uh, uh, you see the tuning uh, of individual synapses that impinge onto one of these neurons where you earlier 
saw the output. So for example, convince yourself that this uh, synapse here is tuned to the uh, cyan uh, direction of uh, the stimulus. So now one can really begin to understand, even in the intact brain, even in behaving animals, how the transformation is made from input at the level of dendroids to output at the level of the somata. And based on these kinds of indicators, work uh, uh, from other laboratories also, calcium imaging has really become a versatile tool in neuroscience. It can interrogate, okay, uh, dynamics of neurons and neural circuits over micrometers, the uh, length scales of synapses, and milliseconds, the time scale of ongoing uh, uh, neural processing in circuits, okay? But of course, uh, we can also track the same synaptic or neural structures over time scales of days and weeks, so we can uh, uh, look at the processes of learning, at least in uh, model systems, okay? And uh, as I'll show you, we can also uh, because of the exquisite sensitivity of these calcium indicators, we can now perhaps uh, uh, look at the level of individual neurons, but now also at the level of uh, entire brain areas and multiple brain areas, because uh, the signal levels uh, of these sensors allow us to sample many neurons um, simultaneously. So how do we uh, now probe? Remember that, of course, all behaviors are uh, the result of multiple, uh, of dynamics in multiple brain regions, often widely distributed across the brain, and we'd like to image neural activity in many of these multiple brain regions simultaneously. How do we go about this? Well, we have to make a microscope that has a very large field of view that allows us to peer in uh, uh, over, that has a field of view that spans multiple uh, brain region. So here is uh, an image of the mouse brain, uses somatosensory cortex, frontal, so premotor cortex, motor cortex. We'd like to see um, at least a sensory and motor area simultaneously, yet we want to keep the resolution that allows us to sample individual neurons. We want to report and characterize activity at the level of individual neurons. And there's, there's this tension in microscopy. Either you have very high resolution, which usually comes with a tiny field of view, or you have a large field of view, like in a microscope, scope, but you lose uh, single cell resolution. It turns out this is not a fundamental uh, problem. It's an engineering problem. And uh, Dan Flickinger and I have been thinking about this problem a lot over the last 10 years. And Nick Sofroni, if a graduate student, uh, uh, joined us and we were able to produce, in fact, a microscope that gives a subcellular resolution over length scales of about five uh, millimeters or so. So we built a microscope that is optimized for two photon microscopy and provides extremely uh, uh, sensitive signal collection and uh, can essentially rapidly access neurons anywhere in a cylinder that has a diameter of five millimeters and a depth of about a millimeter all the way down uh, through the layers of uh, the neocortex. And I'll just show you how this microscope looks. I don't have time to go through a uh, optic, uh, optic schematic with you. Um, I'd be happy to discuss this with any of you. I'll be here today and uh, tomorrow. Suffice it to say, it has a lot of novel mechanisms of scanning. It's uh, all built on this breadboard uh, that is suspended above the animal and moves uh, over the animal in multiple dimensions. The animal, he, he's a virtual reality setup that a mouse might uh, run on. And so uh, this, uh, uh, here is the objective. Uh, the objective alone weighs two uh, kilograms, by the way. Um, so uh, it has the requisite res subcellular resolution. Let me just show you how this uh, looks. Uh, so here, is a LOMAC image that we acquired, and we now digitally look through the image stack so we can zoom into a particular location. You can see that we can see uh, individual uh, neurons. Here you see uh, excluded the dark nuclei light up. Here in this, this is a transgenic animal where every neuron is labeled with uh, 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 a G-CAMP. Now we focus down into layer five near the deep layers, and you can see as we acquired the image, different neurons flash, that corresponds, they're of course active, this is a living uh, awake mouse as we're acquiring uh, this image. Now we z go up and this is the dura that protects the, uh, the skin that shows a lot of autofluorescence. Uh, 
Um, so this is a low MAC image. This is how we often use uh, the microscope. This is at two hertz. We can image about four or five thousand neurons over four uh, millimeters, and that gives us a lot of information. I, uh, of course, the signal and image analysis and signal analysis and machine learning challenges are really something uh, that is uh, very, very uh, much uh, keeping us uh, busy. And uh, finally, uh, one last mode in which we use this uh, microscope most often. We want to image at higher uh, uh, frame rates typically. So what we do is we select brain regions of interest like, uh, for example, sensory, parietal, and motor cortex, and then uh, um, uh, sample a couple hundred neurons in these brain areas simultaneously uh, uh, for analysis. And I, I notice I'm out of time, so I'm going to skip the last couple of bits of uh, data and uh, just summarize that uh, what I've told you is basically that advances in fluorescent proteins uh, uh, for, for detecting uh, neural activity have really driven uh, developments in uh, imaging uh, the brain. These new indicators are now allowing us to build, or it makes now sense to build new microscopes to make use of these indicators. And this loop um, of improvements in uh, indicators for neural function and uh, 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 hardware developments to image deeper, image larger fields of view. This is really only something that is beginning. Uh, and we have not seen yet um, any kind of uh, turnaround, flattening out in uh, progress. So we think we're um, on a good path to be able to uh, look at comprehensively, really characterize uh, during behavior uh, the neural activity, really the neural symphony um, in the brain that underlies um, our uh, perception of the world and our uh, behavior within it. Um, so thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to uh, answer questions if there are any.